Hi, everyone. My name is Marcel. I'm a developer advocate at Google. I'm based in Singapore. And today I'm going to cover some of the privacy changes that we are introducing in Android 11. As you might have seen in the last year, the main focus on Android release was privacy. And future releases will not be different. But before we get into the changes, let's recap a bit. We introduced over 50 privacy features in Android 10, making it our most privacy-friendly release to the date. We make changes in permissions. We add location as a top-level setting, making it easier for users to access the information. We made location permissions more granular, splitting between foreground cases and background cases. We added some background location reminders for, for users to know that an application is using that permission on background. We made the activity recognition a runtime permission because of the sensitivity of this data could uh, provide. Um, we as well restricted a lot of the hardware identifiers that could allow developers to fingerprint users and take information out of their devices. We as well restricted the launching of activities from the background that was misused for developers to pop up suddenly without the user expecting that. One of the main changes in under 10 was that we introduced the granular per location permission. We have seen over half of the users selecting only while the app is in use. And our data suggested that the users understand while in use and are intentional about that choice, providing us with a strong signal that users are choosing to share less information and data with us. We always try to balance between devs and users. That's why we did not downgrade the permissions we introduced. So not at any application was downgraded from always to while in use when the user would switch to under 10. Yet, we wanted to make sure that the users were aware that an app had that permission and they might be accessing uh, the location data on background. That's why if the system detected that an application was accessing the, the location in background, it will show a notification alerting the user about that. We have seen about 30% engagement on that notification that leads to 60% of users that engage to change the permission from always to while in use or even deny it, telling us that the user was not aware of the application having that location permission. So in Android 11, we bring greater protection to the user data. We continue what we started and we focus again on new permission changes, improved scope storage, some of the new foreground services types, and some package visibility changes to ensure that we protect the user for our data and we enforce our developers to follow the best practices. On top of that, we are as well enabling a data access auditing framework that will allow developers to know where of their code is accessing APIs that either require permissions or accesses privacy data. Because we know that we all our apps has third party SDKs. Sometimes our code grows so much that we don't know where this API call is being made. So this API tries to help you to find out. We want not be covering this part on these days, we will focus on the privacy changes. So with further ado, I'm going to start introducing some of the privacy changes with it. In Android 10, we saw the users were choosing to share less private data with the apps with the new location setting. We also saw that there are many apps which request background location access with no need for it. So we ask our users what other types of data are important to them. With no surprise, microphone, camera, or video were one of the parts that they were interested on in being sure that the applications don't they get access to it all the time. So based on the feedback in Android 11, we are bringing users more granular control over user privacy to data location for camera and microphone and significantly limiting access to background location. But we do not do this out of the blue. Our studies indicate that permission changes are well received by users. And not even, not only that, they as well are asking for more. They want to have more control over it. And we have seen users asking for 
some sort of way to give only one time permission to the app instead of always granting this permission forever. So we listened and we introduced what we call one time permission or as shown to the user only this time. That means that user will be able to grant temporary access to the location permission while the app is being used for this time. Meaning that if the system detects that the user is no longer using the application, the permission will be revoked. So next time the user tries to open the app and use this feature, the permission will be revoked. So you will have to ask it again. One remark here as well is that there is no more deny and don't ask again option. Instead of showing four buttons, there are only three. And here we made the system decide when the user denied enough times that we will deny and permanently deny this permission. So we avoid applications over asking for permissions. The same applies for microphone access. Users might be concerned that an app has access to record audio. So now they have the choice to maybe only grant it when they are going to use that feature. For example, a voice call feature in your app could just prompt it to the user the permission and select only this time because they are using it on that moment. But then the next time they open the app and they don't use this feature, they don't need to grant you access. So they will not your application will not have access. But if the user wants to use the feature again, then they could, uh, you can ask again for it. The same logic applies to audio, item, uh, camera, or video. The user might only need the voice call, for example. And maybe one time they decide to actually um, do a, a video call. And then they grant only this time, because it's the only time they wanted to use that. But maybe the next time they open the app and they see that the feature was useful for them, they might feel more confidence of why your app is asking for that permission and grant while the app is in use. So you might have this important question in mind. Do I need to change anything to work with one-time permission? And the answer is nothing. The one-time permission gives you access to those APIs with the, while the user is using the app, only revokes it after the user stops using the app. Similar behavior that could happen before. But to explain a bit further this, what it means is that you, if, you, the, if the user grants you only this time and goes up of the app, either because switched to a different app, it went to the home screen, it may be locked the device. So the permission will be revoked eventually. And I say eventually because we are obviously giving some grace periods before we revoke the permission um, to avoid like when user is like, for example, app hopping. They might be opening a notification that uh, displayed and open an app and then just come back to yours or selecting something uh, for your application. So we wanna ensure that we are not over revoking the permission so that we will be prompting users a lot for the permissions. An important note as well is that foreground services are considered a foreground use case. They basically, show the user that the application is still running via notification, but there is no activity on top. This is considered a foreground use case. The same while the option of while in use, you could still use uh, a location on a foreground service. The same applies for only this time. So in a nutshell, one time and while in use are actually the same. They allow the app to access APIs that request these permissions while the app is in use, the difference is that one time will revoke the permission after the user is no longer using the app or maybe the foreground service already terminated to do the task. So no, you don't have to do anything. If you are currently following the best practice. So the best practice are designed in a way to aim to make sure the user understand the permission before granting it and why your application really needs that permission. Let me explain with the real use case. So let's imagine we have a chat application where Bob is asking Alice to share her location. Alice sees the share button that hints the possible actions. This displays some sort of menu 
that actually shows several options, but clearly separate them on a way that the user might not accidentally click on those. This does not care how you implement on your application. The important point here is that you avoid users clicking buttons that might request location, might request a permission um, by accident, because we want to ensure that the user allows the permission willingly. So Alice taps that location button, and this triggers what we call the request best practice. It's this pseudocode that actually applies to any runtime permission, where basically, first, we will check if we um, have this permission. If not, most likely the first case, we will then go into a should show request permission rationale. This is a system call that will return true if the system decides that there is not enough context or that the user might not be sure why you're asking for that permission, telling you that you should actually explain why you're using that before requesting the permission. Most of the time, not always, it will return false the first time, meaning that it will tell, yeah, you go ahead and ask the, the, the user. So then you can request the location, the permissions, any permission. But in our case, we are requ requesting the location permission. This prompts what we call the system UI um, permission request that offers the user to select one of these options. If you have explained maybe before, or you have your flow is clearly understood by the user, most likely they are gonna accept this permission. But let's imagine that maybe it's not clear why the permission is needed for this feature. So the user, in this case, Alice, clicks deny. On that moment, our request permission result will be called, telling us that the permission was rejected. We then should make sure to explain the user which functionality is not working because of that action and highlight it on a several possible ways. One would be like to try to explain it via snack bar that the, we could not share the location because the permission was rejected. As well, we highlight the button to indicate maybe that this was the action that triggered that um, um, request. It doesn't really matter. It just matters that you really try to explain the user what happened. Because then the user might realize, OK, in order to use this feature, I actually need to um, grant the permission. So let's imagine that after that or another day, they try it again. This time, the should rational um, method would most likely return true because it detects that the user might not be really sure what you're asking for that. So here's where it's really important for you to provide an in-context UI explaining at your best why the permission is needed for the feature that you try to do for the action you're trying to do. And even more important is offering an opt out to the user. In this case, for example, with the cancel button to allow user to say, no, I actually do not want um, to, to grant this permission before you even ask to the system to request the, the, the permission. Because this will avoid prompting the user with the system dialog where they might deny and this time deny permanently because that's what we don't want to what we want to avoid that the user actually denies permanently and here is up to the user to decide if okay i understood why they are using it so i'm going to allow access and then they're going to be prompt with the request um, the system uh, ui most likely at that moment the user will understand clearly and if it already click allow on your dialogue, they're most likely going to give you already access. Then you just um, do the action that was supposed. So finally, Alice uh, decides uh, to grant us permission, and we can share her location with her. Clearly note that we are not trying to distinguish if the user selected only this time or while in use. Both mean the same for us. If Alice selected only this time, it's fine. Next time she wants to share the location, they she will be asked again for the permission. But it's up to her to decide if she wants to share it, if she wants to grant this permission all the time or not. We should not do anything. We should just follow the same flow all the time, the same best practice. All right. So this was an example of how you can, an application, follow the best practice for um, runtime permissions in general, but based on the foreground location permission request. 
Now let's get into the part where we explain how we are actually making location permission even more special. So we already split in Android 10 between foreground access to location and background access. Depending on your use case, you might need one or both permissions in order to perform some of the features. This gives users a fine grained control of how they want to grant your application access. And we encourage developers to only request for foreground and only incrementally request for background when there is a feature that might need that, instead of automatically ask for background directly. In Android 10, this was just introduced, but was not really enforced by the system. In Android 11, this pattern has become an, a requirement. So if you are actually only requesting for foreground location, there is no change. There is nothing you need to handle. There is only the only this time change. And if you handle, if you handle the best practice, as I mentioned before, you should be fine. And this is, for most of the cases, the only permission for location that you will need. Where it comes a change is when you are actually have a feature that might request background location, for example, geofencing. In that case, it's important that you incrementally ask for permissions, since in Android 11, if you target SDK 30, meaning you are targeting uh, Android 11, and the app is running on an Android 11 device, you will not be able to request foreground and background at the same time. Instead, you have to eventually, in some moment, request the foreground. And then when there is a feature, for example, a geofencing that might request it, on that moment, follow the same best practice I explained to request the background permission. And here is even more important to follow the best practices because we are not going to prompt the user with a dialogue. We are going to bring them directly to the location setting permission screen. This screen is the same that they can access when they go to settings and, and permissions and then to location. But the background location permission request will directly prompt them to there, where they can actually choose to allow or to even deny. You can choose any of these options. So it's really important that you explain the user why do you need this extra layer um, permission on the location and offering them to opt out before you actually request, because you want to avoid to over request for background location permission, because there is a limit of times that you can do that. We obviously don't want to break apps. So that's why if your application is requesting foreground and background at the same time, and you are still not targeting uh, Android 11, so API level 29 or below, and your app is running on an Android 11 device, we are going to show a permission that composes the foreground and background permission request. So you will be able to do that without breaking the app. The problem is that this UI is way more complex because we're offering the three options for the foreground uh, permission and then explaining the user with our own words that the app is requesting for more access to the background. They can change that on the settings. So here is really important that you follow best practice and eventually migrate to uh, target API level 30 to make sure that then you have the more um, proper flow, as I explained before, requesting incrementally the permission. So in a nutshell, if you're only requesting for foreground location, you will be fine. There is, you can still do that. There is no change there. Following the best practice, there will be no problem. If your application is requesting both permissions, and you're still targeting API 29, you're going to get this middle dialog where the opt-in for background location is going to be in the description. And then it's going to prompt to the settings screen. Or if you're already targeting API level 30, then you will be able to prompt the user directly there. So my personal take is that you should review the usage of your permissions. Do you really need background? Review the different UX flows and adapt to the best practice. Because actually following the best practice normally leads to be able to faster increment the target SDK for your applications and be able to support new versions of Android faster. With this, I finish the permission changes. But following to the same topic,
Hello, everyone. My name is Xiao Dao. I'm a Google Developer Advocate in Singapore. Uh, today, I'm going to walk you through the changes on app compatibility framework and uh, non-SDK interfaces. So we'll take a look at the, the app compatibility framework first. The main purpose of app compatibility framework is to provide developers the control and the flexibility when they test their app on a newer version of Android. On Android 11, Google has introduced new tools for testing and debugging developer app against these behaviors. So these tools are a list of toggles. They are part of the app compatibility framework. Developers can easily turn on or off these toggles to test when of the behavior change. You can use either ADB command or the setting UI to disable or enable these changes. These toggles could better help developers to conduct an incremental test or isolate all the changes bring by each behavior. So we can turn one of the toggle off to test our apps against the rest of the behavior change. Or we can just turn on one of the toggle, isolate this change and test our app against it. There are two types of changes on Android 11. The first one is the changes that affect all apps on the platform. The second one, we call it target SDK gated changes. So this change affects apps targeting Android 11. So the toggles covers both of these two tabs. With this new testing tool, developers can easily turn on or off a behavior change on Android 11 and test their app against it. When the developer's app's target SDK is lower than the gated version, these target SDK gated changes are off by default. Developers can switch them on, see how this change will affect their app when they upgrade their target SDK version to a higher level in the future. You can see in this process, developers doesn't need to change the manifest file and doesn't need to go through the long building process. This will save us plenty of time. These toggles are not always available. So here we have a policy table. The rows of the policy table are the build tabs of Android platform. And the columns of this table are the build tabs of developer app. We can see from the first row, if developers are testing their app on the user debugable build of Android 11, these toggles are always available, no matter developer is using a debuggable app or not. For the, developer, for the developer preview version or beta version of Android 11, these toggles will only be available if you are testing your app with a debuggable app. For the public release build after Android 11 released, these toggles will only be available for the target as for the target SDK gated changes. So this URL contains all the change and the details for the toggles. Please take a look. Next part, I'm going to introduce some changes to the non-SDK API. On Android 9, or Android P, we have introduced uh, a notion of different, different API list. Public SDK is covered by whitelist. Google encourages developers to use the APIs in whitelist. Other APIs are not supposed to be used by developers, and uh, we plan to eliminate this usage. We call them non-SDK APIs or non-SDK interfaces. Because Android doesn't guarantee a similar behavior across
cross-release for these non-SDK methods. So relying on them is not a good idea in the long run. Depends on how heavy these APIs are being used. So we put the APIs in different lists. The public SDK was covered by the whitelist. Developers are encouraged to use the methods in the whitelist. On the other side, we have blacklist. The APIs in blacklist are fully restricted. Developers are not supposed to use any methods in blacklist. Between whitelist and uh, blacklist, we have a gray list. These APIs, developers can use them under certain conditions. Within gray list, we have a dark gray list and light gray. For the APIs in dark gray list, the usage are restricted for are restricted for apps targeting a certain API level. But for light gray list, now there's no usage restrictions. But if, you, if your code is using the APIs in light gray list, there will be a warning and uh, Google may restrict this API in the future. So we put APIs in different lists, try to provide a smooth process when users upgrade their apps to a newer version of Android. We try to leave enough time for developers to migrate all their methods to public SDK. This is because we see a lot of issues happening when apps upgrade their upgrade from a lower version of Android to a higher version if they are using an SDK API. So this usage uh, not just from your code, it can also come from the libraries your code or project are using. Also, we have seen a lot of issues. We have also seen a lot of DRM issues if the developers app are using these nine SDK APIs. On Android 10, Google has added and supported app usage annotation to signify nine SDK API. This annotation has been scoped to target API level by a max target SDK parameter. If you didn't see this parameter on API, that means this API is in the light gray list. You are able to use it now. But if you see the max target SDK equals to zero, that means this API is in the blacklist. Developers should not use this API on any version of the Android platform. Sometimes you can see the max target SDK equals to a specific API level. That means this API is accessible by apps with target SDK version up to this level. Anything about it cannot access. In Android 11, we have shipped a bunch of APIs to a, more restrict, uh, to a more restricted mode. These APIs may be still accessible for apps targeting Android 10 or lower. But for apps, if they are targeting Android 11 or higher, the access will be restricted. Please keep in mind, this change will not affect the app at the time when Android 11 is released, but only when your app's target has a version upgraded to 11, uh, uh, to Android 11. So in Android 11, we have increased whitelist and blacklist. We have managed to reduce the light gray list. These non-SDK APIs are capped, so we are preventing things from getting worse. Non SDK test APIs are blacklisted by default. Developers can continue to use test APIs that are part of the gray list. New system APIs for mainline are blacklisted as well. Please look for alternatives 
in the public SDK. If you cannot find a proper alternative in public SDK for your use case, please submit a request to Google to add a new method in the public SDK. Developers are able to use the following methods to check the non-SDK interface usage in their code. First, we can build and run a debugger app. While running through the test cases, the system will print out a log message if our code tries to trigger any of the non-SDK interfaces. Secondly, we can also upload our app to the testing track of Google Play Console. After being uploaded, our app will automatically get tested for the, for the potential issues and a pre life report will be generated. If you, are, if you are using Android Studio, the Lint tool can help us to inspect our code, give us either warnings or errors depends on which API our code is trying to access. And finally, developers are also able to use the strict mode API or Veridex tool to check non-SDK interfaces. This is my last slide. In the following part, my colleague Marcel will introduce some of the system UI improvements on Android 11. Let me hand over to myself. Hey, hey there again. Thanks, Yodao. Um, before I start, just a quick reminder, the Q&A, the questions can be um, asked uh, on the section here below, even that Every time that the new section comes up, the question might seem to disappear. We are keeping track of those. So just uh, please go ahead and feel free to, to add the questions here. Or if you're watching uh, the YouTube uh, live stream, you can as well pause the questions in the chat and we are monitoring that as well. All right, so we have covered a lot so far. And you might be wondering, where are the new shiny things that we want to add into our app to make them even better? OK, OK. Let's cover some of them. Finally, a better control for your keyword. We know this was a struggle for many of you. For many years, you were not able to know if a keyword was uh, showing or going down, like the hiding APIs were a bit, yeah. So we are finally giving a developer two ways to have more control over the keyword. One is via a callback interface that gives you some of the states of the keyword and then you can react and make things like hide some views show some views uh, maybe move them but not even that not only that we are as well providing a new api that gives you control of the animation of the keyword so you can combine your own uis with the keyword filling for example in this video when the user over scroll it will smoothly scroll like together with the with the bill. So this API will give you um, control over the duration, the interpolation, and the position on the screen. It's a bit too much to cover all those APIs right now. So I will just go quickly over um, the main important points. So let's just start taking a look at the callback API. This is a callback that from Android 11 on, you will be able to attach to any view. Basically, it will tell the view, it will notify the view, it will notify the callback that the keyboard, the different states of the keyboard. So we will have, for example, that when the keyboard is uh, preparing to be displayed, it will notify you. The same for when it's starting and it will notify you all the progress, all the way, finally telling you when it finished. This will allow you to have a, a lot of control of how your views should react to that. If you want to know more on how this is implemented, for example, on the video I showed before, there is already an existing public sample on the official Android uh, GitHub under, um, here you could see it on the bottom of the screen. 
uh, where it explains a bit better what you have to do and the different um, uh, types of actions that you can do to in, in order to implement the behavior you saw before. So as I said, this is not all. We have as well this API that will uh, give you control over the keyboard animation, allowing you to modify like the duration, the interpolation, and so on. This is a more advanced uh, API and requires a better knowledge of how BIOS works, how user interaction, for example, controlling the touch, uh, how animations work. So it's a bit more complex and we don't have the time nor like could fit the codes in this uh, slide. So again, you can check the public sample that will show how to implement uh, the animation you saw before. But on a quick map shell, what you can do is take control providing some of the information like the interpolation, the duration, the type, and attaching a listener that will give you control of about the keyboard and allow you to implement great animations to combine your UI with the keyboard. All right, so another thing that we are adding on Android 11 is something we call variable frame rate. So as you might know already, there are some devices on the market that allows to modify the frames per second. Normally, most of the Android devices were going on 60 frames per second. But in the recent years, we have seen more and more devices supporting more frames per second that gives better performance, for example, for games or video. So Android as well evolves when the devices evolve. So on Android 11, we are introducing this new API that will allow you to change the frame rate on runtime and as well specified already uh, beforehand. So this new version will allow, for example, to change from 60 frames per second to actually 120 frames per second. This will give you, your application, an extra performance on the bill. This is important for games and maybe some other apps, but keep in mind that if your app does not need this extra performance, you should not change this variable frame rate. And as well, it will not work on all the devices. It will only work on the devices that support higher frame rates and as well supports the new uh, variable API. Did, one, did someone said crash? We all know we are great developers, but crash happens. And sometimes these issues happens on the most unexpected way. And at the end, we hope for the best that we can get enough information out of these issues. Because sometimes what happens is that these issues came from native crashes or maybe unhandled exceptions that will kill our Android process. So it will kill the process that the application is running on and causing that some of the uh, crash um, frameworks not able to get that crash actually because the process will be killed automatically and you don't get this information. So then you get users reporting that there was a crash and you do not have enough information. You don't know what is happening. That's why in Android 11, we are actually bringing a new API that creates a, what we call an app exit info ring buffer. That basically means that every time an app crashes, it will store the sum of the information of that crash, like timestamp, like the um, stack trace, uh, et cetera. And then when your app comes up again, either because the user opened it or maybe opens it a completely different day. It doesn't matter because you will be able to access this information. You will be able to query what were the questions there. And either maybe you can show some extra information to the user that already happened there, or you just can fetch directly this new crash into your um, crash report tool. And since you have the, the timestamp and you have all the information necessary, you will have proper data and accurate for when that crash happened. Uh, one quick note here uh, is that this is a buffer. So if there are many crashes, this buffer will start cleaning the old crashes. So you cannot access all the history of all your crashes. So it's just a buffer. Take, it, take, it, take that into account. And with this, I'm finishing my part, but obviously there is way more that we don't want to overdo here and, and cover everything. 
There is even more things that coming in Android 11. As you have seen on the timeline, we are still on developer preview. And when the beta comes, there will be more announcements. But if you want to keep up to date, please subscribe to the official channels like YouTube, Twitter, or, the, or specifically the Android developer uh, blog posts, where we keep them up to date with the latest news and all the information with code labs, new GitHub repos uh, showing some of the samples, et cetera. Hello, everyone. My name is Xiao Dao. I'm a Google developer advocate in Singapore. I'm working with developers on Android. Today, I'm going to quickly walk you through two other changes on Android 11. The first change I want to talk about today is the MAC address restriction. So we all know the MAC address is, is globally unique and uh, users are not able to reset it. So Google doesn't recommend developers to use MAC address for any form of user tracking or user identification. On Android 10, Google has randomized the MAC address for apps, which is not privileged apps. And MAC address is no longer accessible if your app is targeting Android 11 or more. Developers can only access network interfaces with an IPv4 address. We recommend developers to use higher level of APIs like the Connectivity Manager instead of the lower level APIs. The second change I want to share today is Google has introduced additional restriction to the system alert window. So we know developers are able to create a floating window over other apps. For example, some apps create a chat bubble, display it over other apps or show it on the home screen. Users can easily use the chat bubble to talk to their friends. In earlier version of Android, developers are able to create an intent with action manage overlay permission and specify a package name in the intent. This can bring users to an app specific screen where users can manage the permissions. On Android 11, this is no longer possible. If developers pass the package name in the intent, the platform will ignore it. Developers always need to bring user to the top level screen where user needs to select your app first, then grant or revoke the system alert window permission. This affects all apps running on Android 11. So these are the changes I would like to share with you today. And in the following part, we are going to have a QA session. You can ask for any questions regarding to the topics we have shared today. Um, feel free to leave your comments or feedback in the comment area below. Let's go to the QA part. 